Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to this narration of the web novel Burning Stars, Falling Skies, taken from both HFY and Royal Road. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please subscribe, like, and comment so that the great algorithm in all its wisdom decides to help grow this channel. Chapter 16 At the Threshold Three Dax stood on the Meridian Station observation deck silently. To her right stood Dallas and Bakai, while Penfrak and Dorma occupied her left. It was a rare occasion for all three of her daughters to be present at the same time as Three Dak. The threat of the Marxist terrorism loomed large, and potential loss of the Empire in an unlucky bomb or radiation leak eliminated all of them at the same time would be catastrophic. Still, Three Dak wouldn't hear otherwise. Katasha's fleet was leaving Dodger's orbit to accomplish something the humans never had, to beat back the invaders. Slowly, the brilliant plumes of the fleet's fusion torches disappeared from the view of the incredible distance robbed the ships of all semblance of speed. Remoteness and funny that way, intellectually, Threedak knew that the ships were moving away at kilometers per second relative to Dodge, but in her vision they crawled. It was the same with the planet. Great cities housing millions of Dodge Dahl appeared to be motes of silver and light in the heights of the belt. Three Dak sighed and glanced at Dorma. Maybe it was the melancholy of watching her daughter go off to risk her life, but she couldn't help but wonder what time and distance would do to her memory after she passed. True, those who consumed her would remember Three Dak with perfect clarity, but who would she be to the rest of Dutch Tower? The Marxists sought to demonize her, slandering her with words that barely understood. Maybe she was an imperialist. She certainly wasn't a Bugassi. She snorted. If they were going to try and insult him, they could actually be accurate. How could an empress be anything but a feudal lord and a monarchist? Frankly, these days robots did most of the factory work, and the Marxists drew their numbers from amongst the clerks and managers. If anything, the Marxists were the Bugassi. Of course, some of them actually understood Marx enough to know that. It was just words to them, an excuse to work less despite the ravening Starvok of the invaders and the Dodge Dog collective throats. She smiled slightly as Pinkrack shifted behind her. Her daughter was only a little bit better than the Marxists. Pinkrack and her disciples sought to preserve the history of the entire empire by her art, but all of it lionized Threedak, whether in painting, sculpture, or vid drama. She was always portrayed as a noble and intrepid pioneer, braving untold hardships to force culture on her neighbors. Every Dodge child that played her was at least 20% larger than she was, their coloration computer enhanced until they practically glowed. After a decade or two of fawning media, 3 was pretty sure her citizens couldn't be able to recognize her in a crowd. Her daughters and her guards dwarfed her, and her coloration was still muted from the harsh growth phase with barely enough food and around zero shelter. She certainly wasn't a dashing figure cut by the vidstars as they slashed and quipped their way through the surrounding tribes. Finally, she exhaled, doing her best to avoid coughing, and turned to her daughters. Bakai was staring out of the viewport, a pensive look on her face, while Dala spreaded, opening and closing her graspers while shifting her weight. Pengrak, at her usual, gazed off into space, disconnected and aloof. I worry too, Threedak spoke quietly to her daughters, but your sister will be fine. Where her fleet outmasses the invaders by fifty percent. I know, Berkai replied, her throat pouches flattering in discomfort. At the same time, I can't help but worry. We only have long-range passive scanners of the invader base, for all we know, they have another three torchships powered down and ready to spring on us. I really won't feel safe until she's close enough to scan them with active sensors. Even if she wins, Starless fussed at her sides, trying to smooth her scales with the graspers. There'll be casualties. She's in the most powerful ship in the fleet, but that would just make her a bigger target for the invaders. I don't want her to win at the cost of her own life. Come now, Threedak chuckled slightly as she led the other Dodge Doll away from the viewport. 
You're the ones who convinced me to let her lead the expedition. It's hardly fair that I have to be the one quieting your concerns. Either way, it'll be almost a week before Katash Fleet gets when he went near the invaders, Bukai said from behind Threedak. I don't want to spend that time worrying. I'm just concerned that something I did would hurt Katkat, Bukai said. Uh, we've tested every system and all the ships a thousand times, ran the thrusters at a hundred percent while having them fire at static targets. Everything that we could think of, I just can't help but fret over the possibility that we missed something, something in the designs that'll break down at a critical point in combat. I really don't know how I'll be able to take a week of anxiety without any sort of resolution. We just need something to take our minds off the invader, Starless interjected, her tail twitching restively. Makai has been meeting her production numbers, but my analysis has noticed a worrying trend. She paused, forcing the rest of the group to stop and leave her behind. Thridak simply looked at her daughter, waiting for Darnus to finish. Makai, on the other hand, was less patient. Out with the dull, she snorted. You just can't drop a cliffhanger like that and get all shy. It's just not how things work. The Marxist, Darlis, blurted out, her tail thumping against the station metal floor. Their propaganda has been more effective than expected. It's still not a lot of people, but we've always had about 10% of our population, usually not from our line, that don't buy completely into the concept of unity. They still work their jobs, but they're disaffected, not truly connected with our society. The increase in workload as we geared up for Kantasha's expedition led to a lot of complaints and dissatisfaction from them. Dallas continued, Many of the complainers are flirting with joining the Marxists. That's the bad news. And so many of our people would be so willing to sell our collective destiny just to work a few less hours a day. The good news is that the influx of Marxist recruits has allowed us to infiltrate them. Wait... Dredak interjected before breaking down into a series of coughs and racked her body. Almost after a minute, she continued speaking, exhausted. Do we know the location of the Central Leadership Committee? Yes, Dardis responded cautiously. Are you all right? That was Mother. Bakai's eyes were fixed on Dorma's hand, who was stationary avoiding her gaze. You'd tell us if something was wrong, right? I've noticed Dorma nearby almost as much as Bawal and the rest of your guards. Is there anything we need to worry about? No, isn't it time to be concerned about that? Threedak waved a grasp at dismissively, still gasping for breath. We need to bring down the Marxists once and for all. It was one thing when they were just advocating for work slowdowns and increases in pay. Once they started bombing factories and killing Dutch Dull, they sealed their own fate. But, Darla stared at Threedak, worry in her eyes as a membrane snictated. Katash isn't here, so command falls to you, Darlis. Threedak heard a grasp on her daughter's shoulder, squeezing tenderly. Talk to the marines and put together a team. Use as many soldiers as you want. I don't want any of them to escape. Don't change the subject. Bakai began, but staring down Dorma. I am the Empress, and I will change the subject if I want to, Threedak replied dryly. Your concern is noted and appreciated, but it is time to rid ourselves of these parasites once and for all. Four days later, Threedak and her daughters reconvened in the Meridian Station's command center. They still fussed and fested over her, but Threedak wasn't going to let her health stop her from purging this society. She didn't mind the dissidents. After all, even the smartest of beings were prone to miss important details here and there. Having a subset of the Dodge Doll that disagreed with her viewpoint was an important element of preventing it from growing stagnant. That said, denying simple truth was anathema. That these invaders existed, that all Dodge Doll needed to work in order to thrive, that their society was better off today than it had been a collection of hunter-gatherers dying of hunger, disease, or predators almost as soon as they were hatched. This was a viewpoint that harmed the Dodge Tal as a whole. Honest disagreement was to be cherished and nurtured, but parasites that denied the rain even while standing soaked in the open, they needed to be removed as a whole before they poisoned others. Alice, Redak nodded her head towards the rather skittish daughter. Please announce the beginning of the operation. Mother, Dahlia spreaded, this is Cutlass's job. I don't want to overstep my authority. Are you sure that we can't just wait until she gets... Daughter, 
Vridak chided her softly, a smile stretched across her muzzle. Katash is better at fighting and leading in combat than any Dodge Tal has ever hatched, but you are the best at organizing and supplying an operation. This is not the early days. You are not fighting an existential threat to our empire. You are crushing a bug that we have let live for far too long. It'll be fine. Give the order. Dallas ran across us over his scales and then face and neck, smoothing them in one last time. Then she reached forward and pressed the button on the command center, bringing up the image of a Dodge Tar wearing battle armor painted in colors that Imperial Marines. Captain Salat, Dala spoke, a quaver in her voice slightly undermining the formal tone she attempted to take. Please initiate Operation Haunting Spectre. Three Dak smiled again. As much as she enjoyed watching Darlis come into her own and overcome her omnipresent nervousness, Svitak had intervened in the name of the operation. Even if the Marxists didn't know the first thing about Karl Marx himself, that didn't mean that Svitak's memory didn't contain the contents of his book. Given the sense of the violence and the setbacks caused by the Marxists, at the very minimum, she could have some fun at their very final expense. With a pleasure, Minister... Captain Salat's voice was clipped and formal. Dak forgot that she was Katas's daughter or granddaughter. Over the years, the family lines had all become a bit indistinct. Regardless, she had inherited her sire's serious tone of voice and burnt orange striping. From the belt, twenty dropships fell into the atmosphere. Ungainly and ugly vessels, each was capable of reaching orbit under their own power. But today, they displayed their primary purpose— Gliding on stubby wings, the dark craft glowed in the dark dodge night. As the atmosphere heated it up, their plating was cherry red, turning them into a deadly hail of shooting stars. On cue, they all banked and changed their angle of descent, shredding momentum and letting their plate cool slightly. Minutes ticked by as they flew towards their target, located in the hills just outside Lament. Without using their thrusters, it would be wrong to call it flight silent. After all, the speed with which they plowed through the atmosphere easily generated a sonic boom and the heavily dopplered sound of a freight train. Still, with their reactors silent and their thrusters unburnt, they were fairly hard to see in advanced sensors. The view in the command center switched to a spy satellite floating overhead. As the dropships numbered towards the target, each of them began firing their four mounted railguns. Jerking at their forward momentum slowed them from the cannon's heavy kick. The penetrators left hand-sized holes in the gates of the compound before the kinetic energy discharged into a great blooming mushroom clouds of the interior. Then the dropships rattled visibly and an overhead view of their drop tubes fired backwards. Of the twenty ships, fifteen rapidly fired fifty pods, Little more than black armored shells equipped with drag chutes, a single-use landing engines, an impact-resistant shell. Each carried a dodge tile warrior in full battle armor. The other five dropships opened up cargo bays, releasing walkers strapped to the landing platforms, festooned with parachutes and counter thrusters. The walkers themselves had barely changed from the first introduction, serving as legged or wheeled vehicle support tanks depending upon the terrain. A full armored battalion, overkill, but overkill that the Marxists had richly deserved. The dropship bombardiers did their job, countering much of the ship's forward momentum with the backward-facing launchers and launching the infantry in tight clusters. Quickly, the marines recovered from their rough landings and kicked open the sides of their drop pods and walkers began their final gliding approach. The Marxist compound was in chaos. One or two Dodge Tal got an old-style chemical machine guns and began spraying the advanced forces, only for the bullets to bounce harmlessly off the heavy-powered armor. Fridak could almost hear the heavy crack of the rifles and the marines returned fire. The heavy caliber, long-range slug simply shredded the enemy's emplacements. The handheld rail rifles took time to charge their capacitors, making them slow single-shot weapons. But the range and anti-armor potential was unparalleled. After the first volley, the rest of the marines charged, needle, carbines, and ready to pick off the Dutch tall foolish enough to pop her head out of the compound's walls. Just a short gate, an officer waved a metal-encased grasper, bringing the column to a halt. 
On cue, the two walkers fired their heavy coil guns. The coil guns were a pared-down version of the weapons on tall ships, but their effect was certainly spectacular. The gate and the significant portion of the supporting wall simply disintegrated in a flash of light as they were shredded by the metal flechettes. The Marxists did their best to fight back. Pockets of resistance formed around the rebels with crude rocket launchers and recoilless rifles as they tried ineffectually to use chemical rifles to stop the oncoming marines. Ultimately, it was futile. Even a needle carbine would struggle with battle armor's thickness, leaving only the Marxists around with heavy weapons as threats. Threats that were quickly eliminated by walkers' heavy coil guns or rail rifles firing through the walls. The scary thing about the heavy electronically propelled penetrators wasn't necessarily the slug itself. At high enough speed, they simply turned whatever they hit into plasma. Now, if the target had enough armor, this usually meant that there would be a suitably theatrical explosion on the surface. With the thinner interior walls of the compound, however, the penetrators would just put a small hole on the outside of the barrier. Their inside, however, would be sprayed with the remains of the wall and the wave of overpressure that would hit the force of a blowtorch combined with a grenade. Without battle armor, any one of those forces would be enough to kill Dutch Tull. The shockwave from the shell passed through was enough to rupture their lungs. They flashed heating and was enough to cook everyone in the room to death simultaneously. Even the shrapnel from the shattered wall was enough to mince entire squads. With battle armor, a dodge doll in a room would hit by a coil gun penetrator would require immediate medical attention. Without, the results were, uh, messy. Within 15 minutes, the battle was over. There weren't survivors, mostly because the shock and brutality of the attacks was such that the Marxists didn't even get a chance to surrender. Most died before they even realized that the Marines were approaching their rooms in the compound. Redak slapped Akai's shoulder, and her daughter gave her a fierce grin. All was as it should be. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you enjoyed the story, please follow the link down below and let the author know. If you wish to support this channel, you can do all the usual YouTube gumph, like subscribing, following, and more importantly, sharing. All of these things do help the channel grow. If you wish to do more, there are links for donations, Patreon, and channel memberships as well. And until the next time, I hope that you all have a wonderful one. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.